I, uh, I feel like a little bit like I have a 28 to 3 lead in the third quarter. <laughs> Nothing can go wrong after that. Uh, so, <laughs> for those of you who don't get it, sorry, like all the illusions are going to be like that in the talk. Uh, <laughs> So I came up with this idea for this talk. I, I've actually, I was thinking this is the first talk that I've given at UVM since I, my talk, my job talk to, to get a job here. And that went so badly that the chair was actively campaigning against me getting the job, but she didn't, she didn't prevail. So hopefully this will go better and you won't try to get me untenured or something <laughs> afterward. Uh, all right, so I came up with this idea when I, 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 I uh, noticed that, or I read something about each of the candidates listing their favorite films. And Hillary Clinton's favorite film was Wizard of Oz, so if she won, I was prepared to give some kind of Wizard of Oz feel, which I think is problematic enough. Uh, <laughs> Donald Trump's favorite film is Citizen Kane. So I thought, if you, I, I, I had this little theory, I was probably wrong, that Trump's surprising win was because people decided to vote based on favorite film rather than based on <laughs> the qualities of the candidate, but okay, it's probably wrong. Uh, anyway, so, it's so I thought about this connection between Trump and Citizen Kane, and it's, of course, it's, it's tempting to see the connection between uh, Trump and Charles Foster Kane himself, the character, because both built big financial empires, huge financial empires, through the media, then they sought political office while conducting themselves in kind of the similar way, bombastically, hubristically, et cetera. The parallels between Trump and Kane, impossible to admit, to miss, I think. Uh, but the significance of Kane for Trump, Citizen Kane for Trump, in my mind, lies not in the parallels with his life, but actually in the diagnosis that the film provides of his political success and his political strategy. So Citizen Kane is a portrait of, uh, by the way, I, this is not my, uh, I stole this from someone on the internet, but it's, 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 it's incredible, really. Uh, Citizen Kane is a portrait of a figure of excess, as you can see, see I'm going to explain the film a little bit. I ho hope that you've all seen it, and in fact, I would say that if you haven't seen it, a better use of the next half hour will be getting started seeing it. So if you just walk out right now, I totally understand. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Joel, yes. Okay, it really would be, I swear to God, it's better than whatever, anything I'm going to say. Uh, okay, so it's a portrait of a figure of excess. The film begins with Kane's dying, uh, most people know this, begins with Kane's dying word rosebud. And then it attempts to attach an object to the signifier through a series of failed interviews done by this reporter, Jerry Thompson. He uh, meets all the people that were important in Kane's life, interviews them, tries to understand what Rosebud is, ultimately fails. But the film, the spectator, is, doesn't fail. The spectator, the film shows the spectator what the object is. In the final shot of the film, we see a, a bunch of uh, workers tossing stuff into it. I'm gonna show you for a second, tossing sundry junk of, of canes into a furnace. And one of the things that gets tossed in is a sled, and we see that as the, as the sled starts to burn, we see the name, Ro I just ruined the film for you. We see the name Rosebud appear. Uh, I should have put spoiler alert on the talk, but okay. Uh, it's still great, even if you know the, the end. Uh, okay, so the audience connects, if, as an audience member, you connect this sled not only to the word Rosebud, because, which is his opening word, but also to a scene uh, early in the film where we see Charles Foster Kane as a young boy playing with his parents in Colorado right before his mother sends him away to get a, for two reasons, to get away from his father who was abusive and because she's come into a lot of money, she's inherited uh, for, for some chance reason, inherited a lot of money and she wants to give her son a better life than he would have if he lived with her and, and her husband. So what's interesting is though the young Kane has a nice relationship with his mother, his father's abusive. So it can't be that the sled represents some time of like perfect satisfaction, perfect enjoyment, lost innocence. It just can't be that. Instead, my argument is that the sled stands for loss itself. The sled embodies, in other words, what Cain doesn't have. So those ro the rosebud is, is Cain's dying word. He actually spends his entire life trying to escape from this lack embodied by Rosebud through excessive accumulation. So this is a kind of parallel to Trump. Okay, uh, okay. Uh, this is a little scene, this is, this is very short, it's the end of the film. And you'll see, I think, nicely how we have all these objects that, it's a nice tracking shot, by the way, uh, all these objects that, that Kane has uh, amassed, and then the contrast with the sled.
There we go. Uh, what I love about this scene is that as the, 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 the name Rosebud only fully becomes clear as it's disappearing, which is the, the, you know, it's amazing. I don't know how I even shot it, but it's pretty amazing. So by showing the contrast between the sled as the lost object and this plethora of empirical objects that Kane has amassed, Wells shows one of the, offers, I think, one of the clearest visions of how this dialectic of excess and lack works itself out. Cain focuses on this contrast between the singularity of this impossible object that, that would provide the subject satisfaction and an excessive accumulation of empirical objects that only leave the subject dissat constantly dissatisfied. Cain spends his life trying to fill in lack with excess, but he dies lamenting his abandonment of lack, which is, I think, very interesting. We see in Citizen Cain that excess is a response to lack, an attempt to replace what the subject doesn't have with an excess of what it does have. So that's, that's, for me, the key thing. It's trying to replace what it doesn't have, which is satisfying, with what it does have, and it wants that excessively. Cain responds to lack exceptionally. Most of us aren't like Cain. We don't accumulate that much crap. Okay, uh, but nonetheless, I think, and also Trump, obviously, is exceptional. But I think, in some sense, both function as exemplary subjects. As speaking beings, we're lacking subjects. We have desire that can't be realized. Whenever the subject us, whenever we find a particular object that promised to fulfill our desire, what happens? We quickly move on to some other object. Uh, so no object becomes, proves itself fully satisfying because no object is finally the object. That is the object that would embody what we feel that we've actually, that we've lost at some point. So in the guise of a search for a variety of empirical objects, what we're really doing is seeking out a non-existent lost object that would provide us the ultimate satisfaction. The non what's interesting to me is the non-existence of this object doesn't extinguish the subject's desire, but actually has the opposite effect. The absence of the object produces an excess within subjectivity. So because we're inherently lacking, we as subjects desire excessively. The fundamental overlap between lack and excess, I think, defines subjectivity. But it also marks the subject with an inescapable trauma. That is, the trauma is we can never ex have a pure experience of excess without some kind of lack attached to it. So our capacity for excessive enjoyment is inextricably linked to the fact that we're lacking subjects. So this is a bind we can't get out of. As a result, no amount of X, we can't, no matter how much we accumulate, we never escape from lack. The more we have, the more we feel like we don't have. Okay? I, th I, everyone, I, I assume everyone's felt this way. Uh, maybe not. Maybe you're better than me. Okay. Uh, so Donald Trump's success has a clear relationship to excess. Every, it's obvious. Those who flock to him as a presidential candidate, they profess the hope that he'll bring his economic success that he's had in his, his personal life, maybe, maybe not, uh, to the country as a whole. So we'll have excessive prosperity, 
we'll have excess of security, we'll have excess of identity, whatever that might be. Uh, all these things. So the key to, but, but my contention is that the key to the popularity of his political program, and himself to some extent, lies less in the deployment of excess than in the deployment of lack. That is, he triumphs by convincing supporters that they are lacking subjects who confront an excessive other in the form of whatever, immigrant, China, politically correct university professors, <laughs> okay, that's maybe us, uh, et cetera. Okay. By invoking this distribution of lack and excess, Trump enables followers to enjoy the excess of the other they imagine while at the same time allowing them to think of themselves as not excessive. The importance of Kane for understanding Donald Trump, I think, doesn't lie in these biographical similarities, but in the film's ability to diagnose the reason for his appeal. So, okay, uh, Trump's great insight, I think it is a great insight, uh, I don't think he's genius or something, but it's a, it's a great, great insight, is to recognize that the experience of excess is always surfeited with lack, and thus never as excessive as the experience of excess. So that's the key contrast. So the image of what excess looks like is always seems more complete, more satisfying than any kind of experience, no matter what the experience, even, I don't know, what's a great experience of excess? Skiing down the hill or, I don't know, giving a talk like this? I uh, believe me, the image of it is better than the... Uh, the experience, which is horrifying. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, as a result, Trump's political strategy involves bombarding would-be supporters with images of excess while contrasting them with the lack in those he addresses. So, uh, the, the figures of excess for Trump, as I've already mentioned, are pretty clear. Like, they're Mexican criminals, Chinese political leaders, Muslim refugees, and purveyors of political correctness. While these figures are enjoying their excesses, Ordinary Americans are suffering lack. The contrast, I think, is essential for Trump's appeal. This appeal depends on our inability to recognize how we are already ourselves beings of excess. Without, uh, it's not the excess isn't out there, it's, it's also in here. Uh, the problem is that our everyday moments of excess don't seem so excessive to us, I think. So we spend hours watching a football game on a Sunday, excessive act. Uh, we have a large piece of chocolate cake for dinner instead of a regular dinner. Just random examples <laughs> have nothing to do with me. Uh, but we rarely experience these excesses. That's, that's, how, that's how impoverished my excesses are. It's terrible. <laughs> I, I wanted to come up and say, like, shooting up on heroin, or, but I just have no reference point for that, unfortunately. Or like going to an orgy, but then I, I mean, my God, I, could you imagine me at an orgy? It would be it's just, unima it's so disgusting, it's unimaginable. Okay, sorry. Uh, I'm sorry, I mean, now, now that image is now. Okay, but the point is actually that image is, like, the, so these experiences of excess, if we contrast them with the image of the jihadist, the orgy participant, or even the Hollywood movie star, not to put those items in a series, uh, they never seem as excessive as that, right? So confronted with the image of the excessive other, our experience always comes up lacking. We feel like we're lacking. So it's always easier to recognize the excess, excess sorry, in the other than in ourselves. This is because we, when we are experiencing excess, we never experience it completely divorced from lack. We always are reminded of the lack. For instance, we're watching a football game, feeling totally excessive, enjoying ourselves, get a little brownie maybe on the side and a Coke. And then our child comes in and says, can I help with homework? You know, can you, and then the, the excess is ruined. We're kind of confronted with, or you're eating a nice piece of chocolate cake and then you think, oh, it's gonna be gone in a second, right? That happens to me all the time. Okay, <laughs> I mean, when I used to eat cake, but okay, so, all, as desiring as, sorry, as desiring subjects, we cannot experience pure excess. But we can look at pure excess, sorry for losing my voice, uh, in the figure of the other. This deception involved with regarding the other has, I think, pretty deleterious political consequences. The dynamic of lacking, uh, sorry, recognizing lack in ourselves and excess in the other is the psychoanalytic definition of fantasy. As I say, Fantasy enables to en us to enjoy ourselves indirectly through the excess that we pause, sorry, po posit in the other. Fantasy offers the subject a cure for what it lacks by accessing what the other seems to have. 
So this is the way. So in fantasy, I'm, in other words, my fantasy might be I'm working hard for a pittance. The other is getting government handout for doing nothing. I'm obeying the law while the other is circumventing it without any, uh, with impunity, et cetera. So fantasy targets the other's excess, its ability to enjoy where the subject doesn't. The core, I think, of Trump's political strategy involves speaking to this fantasy and convincing followers that their beings of pure lack, while others, immigrants, et cetera, are enjoying themselves excessively uh, uh, untrammeled by lack. Not only does this contrast between the lacking subject and the excessive other exist, but the excessive other in Trump's schema has stolen the excess that properly belongs to the subject. So it's not just that the other is excessive, it's that they have, our, they have the excess we should have, okay? So this belief that the other has the excess that we should have is the basic formula for paranoia, that the other has stolen our, our, our proper excess. Uh, which is just a sort of one more twist of the logic of fantasy. You can see how fantasy kind of like develops directly into paranoia. Whereas fantasy doesn't attribute necessarily malevolence to the excessive other, paranoia posits the other as the thief of the subject's own excess. So there's the, the other is malevolent and, 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 and at our expense. What this subject cannot see, that is the paranoid subject cannot see, is that the other can only be excessive insofar as it suffers from the same lack as the subject itself. So the other's in the same boat, right, as us. On the one hand, it's interesting because paranoia reminds the subject of all its failures in relation to the other. Like, why would anyone be paranoid? You feel bad. Like, the other has it, you don't. What's the, what's the, what's the gain? The other illegitimately enjoys an excess that properly belongs to the subject. The subject toils away in lack. Foreigners have jobs that properly belong to American citizens. Chinese leaders appropriate the capital that wrongly, rightly belongs to us. Champions of political correctness take away all the little transgressions we should be allowed to have. In all these ways, paranoia ensconces us in disappointment. Sorry. Okay. Hopefully he's taking my advice about Citizen King. Okay. <laughs> Maybe it was just, okay. Uh, I went too long, I think. Did I go too long, Bill? No, no. Okay, okay, okay. Keep going, okay, thanks, John. Okay, uh, I paid him to say that, okay. Uh, everyone else, the people that want me to stop are in the back, okay. Uh, but on the other hand, paranoia is such a satisfying psychic position because it enables us to believe that there's someone who really enjoys a pure excess that has no lack attached to it. There's something really satisfying about paranoia. While attacking the other who's stolen our excess, we actually, in the paranoid moment, enjoy this excess that otherwise would be impossible and, and we would be unable to access. So we actually, it's, even though the other isn't excessive, our relationship to the other allows us some kind of excess for ourselves. Because it provides this access to a pure excess that doesn't really exist, paranoia, I think, has an appeal that outstrips all other psychic positions. Like there's something really fundamentally appealing about paranoia. This is why subjects are so ready to adopt a paranoid attitude, even when it directly contradicts the facts, and even their own moral compass. I have a nice, I, I, I sort of debated about showing you this. I'm gonna show you a little clip from, I don't know if you may saw, may you saw this online. Uh, it happened during the Christmas shopping season last year, so after Trump's election. And uh, it's a, somebody caught this thing on videotape. So it's a woman who's, uh, you'll see, she's very paranoid about the people in front of her. And actually, I, I did a little research. I found out the actual facts of the case are this, the, I don't know where these women are from, but they, didn't, they did not actually cut in line. She's, she's upset with them for cutting in line. That's the basic thing. And often, I mean, I have to say, when someone cuts, like if someone drives their thing in front of you in a line, you, it, you start to feel paranoid. So, I mean, I don't want to be too, the other thing I want to say is don't attribute just pure excess to this woman. Like, she's also lacking subjects. I don't want to, but okay. She deserves, she deserves a lot of uh, critique. But anyway, okay, here we go. Right. Like everybody else did. It starts back there. And it don't bother me if I say it, not if everybody hears me. I think everybody here probably feels the same damn way I do. Thank you. Let's go back to wherever the fuck you come from, lady. Don't think you... Hey, tell them to go back where they belong. They can't act like they, you know, they come here to live and act like everybody else. Get in the back of the line like everybody else does. 
and be somebody. And that's the way I look at it. There are nobodies. Just because you come from another country, they don't make you nobody. Nobody. As far as I'm concerned, probably on welfare, we probably, the taxpayers probably pay for all that stuff. <laughs> It's true. They probably pay. We probably we probably pay for every bit of that stuff. You know that. Probably all the food they get and everything else. I'm sorry, but that's the way I feel. So that's okay. Speak English. You're in America. If you don't know it, learn it. And I'm sorry that I'm that way. But you all need to realize you're not the only ones around here. Okay. So. Maybe. Have, have, have most people seen that before? Oh, almost no one. Okay. Uh, so it's fine. There's a couple of things fascinating about that. Why, my question was, what in the hell are the other people doing? I mean, like, how can you let that happen? Uh, but, but I think the other thing, I mean, she goes through kind of all the things to be paranoid about, right? Like they're on government assistance, they don't know English, they're in, all these kind of things. But so it's, it's like, a, I, it's, a, it's almost like I planted her. She doesn't look like my aunt, and she, it's actually took place near where I'm from, so this is kind of my people, unfortunately. Uh, but I do, I do think that, uh, uh, you notice what she said at the end, when she said, I'm sorry I'm, that w I'm like this. Like, there's a kind of sense that she knew that what she was saying, sorry, saying was wrong, but that's the, that power that paranoia has over, the, over you psychically is that it, it, you can act against what you're, you think is right or wrong. So, and the, I think one reason paranoia is so difficult to undo is that it, it provides the paranoid subject so much excessive enjoyment that it can't, that they're, they're really loath to give it up. This is why, you know, news reports about the plight of refugees rather than their excess or uh, statements about the normality of Mexican immigrants, none of these really have an effect because we all, I think the paranoid subject can believe, okay, even within, that's just, there's, that's a guise of lack, but there's really some excess hidden within that. Uh, okay. The defining fact of, of Donald Trump's career, I think, lies in his successful deployment of both the logic of fantasy and paranoia. That he sort of alternates between the two, I think. I mean, paranoia is still phantasmatic. Uh, he caters his appeal to those who experience themselves as lacking and offers a path to, to enjoying a, a pure excess. In this way, Trump offers his followers a chance to be, I think, Charles Foster Kane. Well, that's the offer. In doing so, I'm going to make a little turn. He simply amplifies the same incentive structure that exists in capitalism itself. So his political success reveals he's learned the basic lesson of capitalism, not as an economic system, but as a psychic one. The capitalist economy depends on subjects viewing themselves as lacking while identif identifying an excess in the other. This is the excess they aim to appropriate through the process of exchange. I think we all do this. Uh, Without this psychic dis disposition, capitalism simply couldn't function. It requires subjects for whom accumulation is the unbreakable law. That's what we, uh, I always want to accumulate more. If we believe that we already have an excess, we would not embark on the process of constantly accumulating more. Like, we just wouldn't do it. Capitalist subjects accumulate with the idea of amassing enough money, enough commodities to allow them to enjoy without restraint. But the problem is, one never reaches, the, is that my phone? Oh, no, sorry. I didn't turn mine off, so. <laughs> I was going to use that as a kind of, I was, I have a, you know how like you go on a date and you're not sure how it's going, so you have your friend to say, call me at a certain time and say, so I have, someone's going to call in about five minutes, so I can, if I answer it, things are going terrible, but if it's, I'll just let it ring if it's going. Okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> no, you think I'm kidding. That is not a joke. <laughs> okay. All right. All uh, right. Okay, uh, so, oh, right in the middle of my main most important point. Okay, uh, the problem is that one never reaches the goal of having enough because the more you accumulate, the more the point of having enough seems to recede out in the distance. Like, I, I, I always think of it like the green light that marks Daisy Buchanan's identity for Gatsby. You know, the green light, the, the closer he gets to it, the further it goes away. So the more one has, the more one experiences lack. So rather than filling lack, ironically, excess ends up highlighting it. So I attain what I want, and it becomes apparent that excess means just a little bit more. I get, I get 
I, 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 get what I, I get more money, I need a little bit more money. I get a nice new phone, I need a little newer phone. I get a 55-inch television, why didn't I get a 70-inch? And actually, this is, t this is true of me, and even my spouse who wanted a smaller one, when we got the 55, she's like, I think we should have gone for the 70. So <laughs> it's just, you know, you just, it's, it's never ending. We'll just give the 55 to the kids, it won't seem too, it won't even seem too decadent. Okay, <laughs> all right, okay. So accumulating inevitably leads to the desire for more accumulation rather than the sating of desire. Okay. Within the capitalist psychic economy, no one can ever say I have enough because one never experiences that one is excessive enough. This is because the experience of an excess can't be as satisfying as the image that it promises it will be. This is the basic problem, I think. Excessive is, a, sorry, excess is excessive only insofar as we don't reach it, which means it can never really deliver us from lack, even though that's the promise. The psychic disposition of capitalism is always on the verge of tipping into paranoia, however, you can see why. Uh, which is why I think capitalist democracy conf constantly confronts the danger of fascism. It's just not, it's not just because, oh, Marine Le Pen grew up sometime or something. You know, it's a constant danger, constantly. Because once people say well, capitalism democracy relies on the fantasy of the other's excess, once you think that excess has been stolen from you, that's the turn to fascism. So this excess is what motivates the subject's incessant competition with the other. Without this fantasy of, the, uh, fantasy of the other or some future time of full enjoyment, no one would bark, embark on the project of accumulation in the first place to the extent that capitalism requires it. I, I have a very nice point I want to make now, if I can say. Uh, even Adam Smith confesses this. Adam Smith, okay, you know Adam Smith, Wealth of Nations. Although, I have to say, I wish this was in Wealth of Nations. It's actually, actually in the early theory of moral sentiments. But okay, it's, the point still holds. Smith points, points out that the wealthy actually live terribly miserable lives. If you know anyone wealthy, this is absolutely true, I think. Uh, but the fantasy that wealth brings complete satisfaction is a necessary one, according to Smith. Here's what he says. He says, this, he doesn't use the term fantasy, but this image, this, I'm quoting, rouses and keeps in continual motion the industry of mankind. Ha. <laughs> If we don't believe in the fantasy of accumulation leaving, leading to the ultimate satisfaction, Smith fears, and I think he's right, we'll cease to accumulate in the way that will keep the gears of the capitalist system going. Okay. Uh, but when this basic capitalist fantasy turns to paranoia about the other stealing the excess from the subject, fascism erupts. So there's this, constant, again, constant danger. Fascism is nothing but the putting into practice of paranoia. It identifies an other or multiple others responsible for the theft of society's excess and engages in the impossible project of eliminating the other. Fascism cannot ultimately, I'm not saying that fascist leaders can't win, but fascism cannot ultimately succeed in its project because its paranoid destructure depends on the other it's trying to eliminate. So it just can't, it can't, it can't work. Okay. I want to return to Citizen Kane quickly at the end. Oh, sorry. No. After naming Citizen Kane his favorite film, Donald Trump suggests, this is amazing, suggests a brief interpretation of the film, okay, which I'm gonna give you. He claims the lesson of the film is that Cain just didn't find the right woman. So, <laughs> Cain married, no, I'm serious, this is true. Uh, Cain married twice, and both times ended in divorce. Trump, okay, he followed Cain's model, married twice, both divorced, but now, is Melania successful? Okay. Uh, as tempting as it is to follow this analysis, I think it is somewhat tempting. Uh, I think Wells' film actually provides a slightly more intricate response to the <laughs> logic of capitalism and fascism. So I don't think Trump's completely on the wrong track, however. Like, the film does focus on the object that provides satisfaction. But rather than positing that Cain simply never found the proper object, like the right woman, the film reveals that his dissatisfaction results from his effort to achieve excess without lack, like completely divorced from lack. Cain's refusal of the necessity of lack condemns him to a life of perpetually, perpetual fruitless striving. Like the, he was, that's, that sort of defines his, not sort of, it defines his life. Wells might have ended the film with a final speech of the reporter Thompson who declares, we can never know what, we don't know what rosebud is, we can never know the excess that defines, a he doesn't use the term excess, but he should have, uh, the excess that defines a person, blah, 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 blah. Uh, 
If he ended the film at this point, Wells would have been proclaiming, we, can't, we just can't know the excess of the other. But it's interesting. This illusion would have left the spectator with no sense of the necessary relation between lack and excess. So, but Wells shows the spectator, we, we cut away from, in that scene that I showed you, we cut away from what uh, the group of people within the diegetic reality see, and we get to see the sled, which Thompson or no, no one in the, in the film can see. Rosebud is not just some mysterious object that Cain enjoys obsess excessively. It's a loss that defines his subjectivity. Wells forces the spectator to see this inevitable connection, connection sorry, between the subject's lack and its excess. The misrecognition of Kane as a subject is, an insi is the insight of Citizen Kane as a film, I think. One escapes the stranglehold of fantasy and paranoia only insofar as one accepts that one's excess is inextricable from one's lack. Excess doesn't fill in lack and eliminate it, but always recreates it anew, which is why the more we shop on Amazon, the more we want to shop. The more we search the internet, this is true of even me, I, I mean, not even me like I'm above, but <laughs> especially me, I guess I should say, especially me. Uh, excess is the path to the confrontation with our lack. The wager of Citizen Kane as a film is that one can accede to the fundamental link between lack and excess. One need not spend one's life endlessly seeking after excess only to be thrust back into lack. One need not, in other words, be a de facto disciple of Donald Trump or model one's life on Charles Foster Kane. It's possible instead to recognize that the image of excess, one sees in the other, is nothing, has nothing more to it than one's own lacking experience. That is it. Thank you for staying. Okay. <laughs>